Well, you heard Judy read the gospel uh, reading, the gospel story. Uh, and in that reading, uh, you will have learned that some Greeks, Greeks, who travel to Jerusalem, uh, they speak to Philip, the disciple, and express their desire to see Jesus. Philip speaks to his fellow disciple, Andrew, and they both go to tell Jesus. Jesus then speaks about his death and resurrection and finishes with an assurance that he will draw all people to himself. We've reached an important juncture in the gospel. And yet, I don't know about you, but I find the story at least just a little bit strange because we're not told whether the Greeks are successful in their mission. Their presence occasions an important discourse of Jesus, but we're told no more about them and they just disappear from the scene. Who were the Greeks? It's not entirely clear what group of people the gospel writer has in mind. Does he mean Gentiles? Certainly the word can be used to denote non-Jewish residents of the Roman Empire. You might remember what Paul says to the Corinthians. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But for those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And the arrival of the Greeks is immediately preceded by the remark of, uh, excuse me, uh, it comes straight after yeah, the remark of certain Pharisees who say, look about Jesus, look, the world has gone after him. So we have a statement about the world going after Jesus, then a story about Greeks who come to Jesus, and then the words of Jesus. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So perhaps the Greeks are Gentiles. And Jesus is saying that after his crucifixion, all people, Jews and Greeks, all people, those in Jerusalem and Judea and beyond throughout the whole empire will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. It, now, even so, uh, when Greeks are mentioned earlier in John's gospel, the word seems to denote Greek speaking Jews who've been spread abroad in the empire. Certainly these Greeks, the text tells us, have come to Jerusalem to worship at the festival. So perhaps they were Jews. Perhaps they were Jews who spoke Greek. Whether Jews or non-Jews, they seem to represent at least that wider world that welcomes the gospel message after the death and resurrection of Jesus. At this earlier stage, they seek an audience with Jesus. And they seem to feel the need for a go-between. Perhaps they have doubts about whether they would be welcomed. Perhaps they're unable to speak Aramaic and they need an interpreter. Either way, they come to Philip of the bilingual town of Bethsaida who finds Andrew, another disciple with a Greek name. Together, the two disciples convey the request of the Greeks to Jesus. Philip and Andrew have learned that no one is too much trouble for Jesus, and they are confident in bringing people to him even people who might normally be seen as outsiders in some way or another. I don't know if you know it, but at least two members of our congregation work as translators or interpreters. What a wonderful and vital service they provide. 
They make it possible for otherwise disparate people to meet and to understand each other. This is like the role of all disciples in relation to Jesus. Like Philip and Andrew, all disciples bring the requests of others to their saviour. They may not know whether their efforts are successful, but it remains their task to pray for others and to seek to introduce them to Jesus by their own words and deeds. To such disciples, Jesus imparts a message. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus is speaking, of course, about his own impending crucifixion by which he would be glorified. He knows that the giving of his life will result in a great harvest. By his death, he will bring eternal life to all who put their trust in him. Yet Jesus speaks not only of the giving of his own life, but also about the way of the cross for all disciples. Those who love their lives lose them. Those who hate them keep them. Now, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea of hating our lives. I think the terminology is easily misunderstood. And I'm clearly not the only one who thinks so. For I noticed that the CEV translation, the contemporary English version, written to be understood by children, modifies the words in this way. If you love your life, you will lose it. If you give it up in this world, you will be given eternal life. Understood in this way, Jesus excludes narcissism and promotes self-giving love. His words do not seek to foster any kind of self-loathing or the kind of self-hatred that leads to self-destructive or self-harming behaviours. Indeed, those of us who struggle with wholly inappropriate forms of self-hatred can find true freedom in the liberating love of God made known to all kinds of people in Jesus Christ. So what does self-giving love look like? Well, of course, it's demonstrated by the cross, by Jesus who goes all the way to the cross. There, Jesus was lifted up that he might draw all people to himself. Yet Jesus invited his followers to imitate his cross-bearing, self-giving love. So there ought to be some examples a little closer to home. I think we see self-giving love in the lives of parents who give their best efforts for the sake of their children. I think we see it too in the work of doctors, nurses and others in intensive care units, for example, who expend themselves for the sake of their patients. Many of you will already know Michael Rosen's wonderful poem written over a decade ago for the 60th anniversary of the NHS. Do you know it? It's called These Are the Hands. These are the hands that touch us first, feel your head, find the pulse and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, 
soothe the sore, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose, and touch us last. In a pandemic, of course, these acts have become for us all the more heroic. Yet surely, Self-giving love can be, can be detected also in your efforts and mine in all kinds of ways. But now in lockdown, can they not be detected in our lives as we eschew for now the full lives that we used to live? As we stay home when we would much rather take a trip to see our loved ones. If Jesus is right, this costly, self-denying love will yet result in a great harvest of fruit bearing. For unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Well, we've all been dying a little as we accept the enforced hibernation of lockdown. In other ways too, we followers of Jesus are learning to give of ourselves as Jesus did, that we might bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. First, death. But after death, resurrection. It was so for Jesus, and it might be so for us, by our self-giving love, our little dying acts of care for others that might yet result in a harvest, a harvest of fruit bearing. We come to break bread together. And as we come to break bread, we sing, I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved and free, the life of Jesus to recall in love laid down for me.